This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. Let's talk a little bit more about emotional wellness. They don't want to go there. It's very, very threatening. Tell me a bit about what you found around infertility and gluten. Oh my goodness, that's what got me into a lot of the apps. Actually, that's what got me into this whole world. Tell me about dairy in the context of gut health, but also in total health. Cow milk protein is meant for a cow. Why now do we have this huge increase in autoimmunity? Oh, there's no question about the numbers. The overall category of the contributing factors is the environmental toxicity. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Expert Series, where you'll meet 25 of the world leaders in health and wellness, discussing their passions and what it takes to make your shift. There's an electrical feeling in the room. I had to be a mom. It was so important to me. I've always been a pain in the butt, and I love that. I knew that I wanted to help people. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. In this episode, we have Dr. Tom O'Brien, an absolute trailblazer when it comes to functional medicine. He's well known for his work on wheat sensitivity and its impact on autoimmune disease, and he's trained and certified thousands of practitioners around the world in this area. Dr. Tom holds teaching faculty positions with the Institute for Functional Medicine and the National University of Health Sciences. He is the author of You Can Fix Your Brain and The Autoimmune Fix, which won the National Book Award and ranked first across several categories in Amazon. Known as the Sherlock Holmes of disease, Dr. Tom's approach is holistic, relatable and common sense. He is passionate about empowering people with the right information. He is the creator of the Gluten Summit and the documentary series Betrayal, The Autoimmune Solution They're Not Telling You. This series has been watched by over 500,000 people and has been received to wide acclaim. I had several people tell me that I just had to get Dr. Tom on the shift and they were absolutely right. I found him to be one of the most enthusiastic, warm and knowledgeable people I have ever met. And his analogies are so clever and simple that they will just blow you away. Listen out for Tom's take on eating dairy products how you can fix your brain, and the reasons behind the explosions in autoimmune disease we're seeing. You'll also hear my favourite health analogy in the world coming up about halfway through our conversation. First up, I asked Tom to introduce himself and tell me what he did. My name is Tom O'Brien, and I'm on the teaching faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, and I travel the world teaching about autoimmunity and the environmental triggers that may set it off, especially wheat-related disorders. Well, big story to how you got there. Um, (laughs) Tell me, what's your story? How did you end up becoming Dr. Tom O'Brien, trailblazer, functional medicine extraordinaire? I opened my practice on Valentine's Day in 1982 and in Chicago, and I had a practice there for 25 years. and, And the day we opened, Uh, Someone gave me a gift, and it was a patient that I had met who was looking forward to being a patient with us, and she said that when she met me, she she had never met anyone with the enthusiasm that I had that seemed to be genuine and not excitement, that there's quite a difference between excitement and enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word enthos, which means the God within. And she gave me this printed quote uh, from George Bernard Shaw, and I printed it out, copies of it, and it was on every one of my treatment rooms. And I'd read it every day uh, for 20-some years. And uh, it just fired me up. And it was, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one the being a force of nature 
instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion my life belongs to the whole, and it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a sort of splendid torch that I have a hold of for the moment and want to make burn as brightly as possible before passing it on to future generations. It became my theme in life is to just look inside and see what really resonates for me. What is it that I have to do? I just have to do this. And I've told this uh, example many times. My son is wicked smart, just Mensa. And when he was 17, thinking about colleges, I said to him, Jason, I don't care if you go to college. I really don't care. And he looked at me startled, and I love it when I can catch his mind. I rarely can do that. That kid's been working me since he was two days old, right? <laughs> but I caught his mind. It's like, what? I said, if you have a passion, if you look at a brick wall and you, how did they do that? How did they make, that is so cool. And you're thinking about brick walls and you're drawing brick walls and you're looking for pictures of brick walls and your imagination is off in building walls. You go find the best brick wall maker there is. I'll finance you for a year or two. I'm financing school. Or if you want to do rock and roll, I mean, really, man, it's in your blood. You got to do rock and roll. You go do rock and roll. But if you don't have something that grabs you by the balls, excuse me, grabs you and won't let go, you go to school because that's where you get more exposure than anywhere else. And my prayer is that you find something in your life, you just got to do this. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you don't hurt people, it doesn't matter. And I promise you're going to be a happy man, have a great life, great family, and make a valuable contribution to the planet. So my son's been ranked now San Diego's number one bartender three times. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So that was about 15, over 15 years ago now oh, that yeah, you started yeah. on this rabbit hole. Yeah. What have you discovered since then? Oh, my goodness. We now have a number of studies. I have a full day course that I do called the Certified Gluten Practitioner Program, and it's online also. And there are a number of studies in there that show every single human does not have the ability to break down the proteins in wheat into amino acids to be absorbed and reused to build new cells. No human breaks down wheat completely. Zero. So anyone that's listening to this, if you're human, you have a problem with wheat. Now, how does the problem manifest? Holland, H-O-L-L-O-N, and Fasano at Harvard published on this a couple of years ago. They took recently diagnosed celiacs, so that's people who are still eating wheat, uh, celiacs in remission for at least a year. They've been on a wheat-free diet for at least a year. People at Harvard diagnosed with non-celiac gluten sensitivity and people that had no problems with wheat, four different groups. And they checked all four groups. Every person gets intestinal permeability every time they're exposed to wheat. Now, people don't like to hear that. They, oh, that's nonsense. No, it's not. Just read the studies. Can you tell me a little bit more about intestinal permeability, how it happens, and then what the end result of that is? Mrs. Patient, your digestive tract is a tube. It starts at the mouth. It goes to the other end, 20, 25 feet long, kind of winds around in the middle of your abdomen there. And if, if you take a donut, and if you could stretch a donut out, and you look down the center of that donut, that's your intestines. It's one big, long tube. When you swallow food, it's in the tube. It's not in the body yet. It's in the tube. The food has to go through the walls of the tube to get into the body. How does that occur? You have to have digestive enzymes to break the food down into really, really small particles. The tube is lined with a cheesecloth. And cheesecloth only lets really small molecules get through. That's called the single cell epithelial lining of the gut. It's a single cell thick, and it does so many functions that are critical to our health. But one of them is it's a barrier. It has to be a barrier like the skin, not to allow toxins to get through the skin into the body. But then it also has to be a barrier like the kidneys. 
that filter and let some stuff go through and not others. So it's got to do both. It's really cool when you think about it, what our guts have to do. This single cell epithelial layer has to act like your skin and like your kidneys. Keep stuff out, but let selective stuff in. How does it do that? It's lined with a cheesecloth. So only really small molecules can get through. But what happens when you have inflammation in your gut, the inflammation tears the cheesecloth. When the cheesecloth gets torn, now these food molecules that are being broken down little by little by little by these enzymes, they, these food molecules, before they get broken down into tiny enough molecules to go through the cheesecloth, they sneak through the tears in the cheesecloth. Bigger molecules get through the tears. They're called macromolecules, big molecules. They get into the bloodstream and your immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not something I can make bone cells with or new neurotransmitters. This is not a building block to make new cells. I better fight this. Now you make antibodies to tomatoes or bananas or chicken or wheat, whatever the macromolecule is that goes through. If your immune system gets activated, you now make antibodies trying to protect you from these macromolecules that get in. These are the patients that do a 90 food IgG panel to see what are you sensitive to. And it comes back, they're sensitive to 20 or 30 foods. They say, oh my God, that's everything I eat. Well, of course it is. Your immune system's trying to protect you. So what do you do? You heal the gut, eliminate the inflammation or reduce the inflammation that's in the intestines. Fastest growing cells in the body, the inside lining of the gut, give it time to heal. Wait three to six months for the antibody load to calm down, then go back and check again. Now you're sensitive to two foods or maybe three. Those are the ones you stay away from permanently. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people from all over the world to shift their health and their life. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why you're here, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is so unique, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where it is that you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Shift With Us. The Shift! Can you tell me um, about the difference between wearing a life jacket and actually fixing the problem? Oh, good question. When a patient comes in with recurrent miscarriages or systemic lupus erythematosus, the autoimmune disease lupus, or recurrent migraines, or arthritis, it doesn't matter what the symptoms are. When the patient comes in, it's like they've fallen over a waterfall and they've crashed into the pond below. They swim up to the surface and, <laughs> oh God, thank God I'm alive, right? Spitting out water, trying to stay afloat uh, in this pond. And you're in the pond of rheumatoid or you're in the pond of diabetes. You're in the pond and you're trying to stay afloat but it's really hard to stay afloat because the waterfall keeps falling into the pond so the water is really turbulent. You're living the lifestyle that caused the eventual problem that now you've got and it's a turbulent lifestyle. So everybody's looking for the life jacket to stay afloat in the pond of diabetes or in the pond of recurrent miscarriages. So life jackets are good. You, you gotta stay afloat, you can't drown. You need the meds, you take the meds. Don't be silly. But you don't stay in the pond. Swim over to the side of the pond, get out of the water, walk up the hill, walk back up the river and figure out what fell in the river that eventually carried you downstream and you fell over the waterfall into the pond of diabetes. That's called going upstream. That's what functional medicine is, is going upstream to figure out why do you have what you have? While you may need a life jacket right now, you may need to take glucophage, or metformin for diabetes, or medication for migraines. You take the medication, but you don't stay in the pond taking the medication. You go upstream to figure out what happened. Where is it coming from? I think it's a really important conversation, and it can often be seen as a us against them. Well, it's either medicine or diet. You know, oh, you nonsense. Can't, you can't do both. Yeah, nonsense, nonsense. What do you think the future of medicine is where in regards to taking this integrative approach where it's okay to use a life jacket, but it is a life jacket and we need to look at the other stuff too. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's critically important to have 
the pharmaceutical world available to use. Critically, critically important. And most of the medications, if you go back and you look at the approval for the medications, they've been approved for short-term use. That's it. They're not approved to use for two years, three years, a lifetime. They're not approved for that. They're approved for short-term use because there were minimal side effects for short-term use. It's critically important that you have life jackets. The problem is the industry, and I don't mean the doctors, but the medical industry is set up to tell you that's all you need to do is wear a life jacket and you're fine because it makes billions and billions and billions of dollars for the people that are selling the pharmaceuticals. The doctors are all trained. They went into medicine because they want to help people, right? And this is how they were trained to help people. They're life jacket specialists. The problem is it's referred to as health care. It is not health care. It's crisis care. You're in the pond spitting up water trying to stay afloat. So you need the life jacket. But until the doctors do postgraduate education, in functional medicine, in integrative medicine, in complementary medicine, whatever the term is that they're using, until they get more education, they are experts in crisis care. And we need them. Thank God. You know, my granddaughter died twice uh, in the hospital. She was born premature. She had brain bleeds. And thank God we've got the healthcare system we have. Northwestern Pediatric Unit in Chicago, best in the world. They saved my granddaughter's life twice. She's two and a half now, and she is a pistol, and nothing is going to stop her in life, right? And she's at the top of her class, the little kindergarten, not kindergarten, but the toddler school, whatever it is. Teachers are always amazed at how responsive she is and how she's at the front asking questions. Thank God we've got that kind of medicine available. There's nothing like it in the world. But it's not health care. It's crisis care, Right? We need crisis care, and then we need our doctors educated. That's why at the Institute for Functional Medicine, all of our courses sell out all the time. Doctors are coming from every discipline to learn upstream medicine. How do I go back upstream and figure out why my patient has colitis? I mean, you know, it's a great example. A most common GI condition, gut condition, the most common condition that gets diagnosed is called IBS, Irritable bowel syndrome. So a patient comes in and they say, Doc, I've been diagnosed with IBS. And they're very serious about it because they're suffering. And I say, well, you know what that means, don't you? It means your bowels are irritated. And they look at me and say, your bowels are irritated. Isn't that what's happening? They say, yeah. And I say it in such a way, so I, I get them laughing. Well, that's a brilliant diagnosis. After all the tests and thousands of dollars, well, you have bowels that are irritated. Well, okay, why are they irritated, right? Where's it coming from? And it, here's an example. They published this study a couple of years ago. It was a multidisciplinary team from Harvard and Stanford and a couple of uh, institutions in England, I don't remember where, and one from Italy, uh, these top gastroenterologists. They took 39 patients that were failures to every treatment for irritable bowel syndrome for at least a year, every treatment at Harvard, at Stanford, at, in England, Italy, 39 patients. And they said, maybe food has something to do with this. I wonder. In the moral words of Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, you think <laughs> you know, the tube is inflamed, it's irritated. Do you think what you put in the tube is causing the irritation or contributing to the irritation? And what they found out was that uh, 28 of those people tested positive. So th they did something called confocal endomicroscopy, really fancy term. They put a camera down into the small intestine and they watched the cells of the small intestine when they put food down there. And what happened to the cells? And they found for 28, I think it was, of these people, within five minutes of being exposed to wheat, soy, dairy, or yeast, and some were responsive to all of them. Some were responsive to one or two. But within five minutes, 28 of these people had leaky gut, intestinal permeability. And you see it. You see it on the screen. There's a video that you can see. There's intestinal permeability. Wow, there it is. Look at it. You see the cells opening up, gapping. They, they had a dye that they had injected. You see the dye coming out into the space where it's not supposed to be. 
you, and, and they say uh, in the study and they published, they said something to the effect of the changes were evident to everyone in attendance. Now, when you're a German, world famous gastroenterologist, that's your way of saying, holy cow, Batman, look at what just happened here. The changes were evident to everyone in attendance. <laughs> but it was food. That, and, and they recommended these people avoid those foods. And every single one of them got dramatic improvements. Some of them complete improvements. Some of them 70%. Some of them 50% improvement within a couple of months. After a year of failure of all of the life jacket medicine. So sometimes, and it, I, I would say most of the time, but it's safe to say sometimes going upstream approach to figure out what's causing the inflammation, what's pulling on the chain is exactly what's needed. We need experts in life jacket medicine. We need world-class education in traditional pharmaceutical approaches. That's never going to save my granddaughter. It's going to save millions and millions of people. But we need to help them understand that they then need to work in conjunction with a upstream medicine doctor, naturopath, chiropractor, acupuncturist. So once the crisis is stable, then that person needs to be referred over. You keep taking your meds and go see Dr. So-and-so to learn about how your lifestyle contributed to what eventually developed for you as an autoimmune condition. Tell me about the gut and autoimmune disease. I can't say every, but I can say most autoimmune diseases have five components to development of autoimmune disease. The genetic vulnerability, Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld uh, will speak to world-class uh, immunologists, uh, speaks to the genetic vulnerability to autoimmune diseases. It's a prerequisite. Next is the environmental trigger. It's a prerequisite. Next is intestinal permeability. The gateway opens up. These macromolecules get through from the environment. So genetics, environmental exposures, a breach of the intestinal membrane. So these environmental exposures get into the bloodstream, activating an immune response. And all of that control of oral tolerance for intestinal permeability is determined to a major part, we're learning more about this all the time now, by the microbiome. So those five components. So any practitioner that is wanting to really dial down and understand the mechanisms of how autoimmune disease develops needs to become familiar with all five components. What's been the development of autoimmune disease? Like why now do we have this huge increase in autoimmunity? Oh, there's no question about the numbers. And the answer is complicated. There are many contributing factors, but the category, the overall category of the contributing factors is the environmental toxicity. Whoever's listening to this right now, wherever you're sitting, is there a carpet on the floor? You're smelling formaldehyde. Are there ceiling tiles? There are phthalates in the air that you're breathing. We can't smell this stuff, but it's everywhere. Are you sitting in an old house right now? There's lead in the paint. And so there's a little lead in the air that you're breathing uh, from the windows going up and down and, and little flakes of paint that are in the corners, and let alone the food, the chemicals, the insecticides, the pesticides in the food. So the whole category is the world we're living in is exposing us to so many toxins, your immune system trying to protect you. This is not an immune system that goes haywire. Autoimmune mechanisms are triggered by environmental exposures. There's a trilogy to this. It's actually, there's five. It's not a trilogy anymore. Dr. Fasano has announced that it's five, and I think he's absolutely right. There's a genetic vulnerability. There's an environmental exposure, and the one we know without any question, is celiac disease. The genes are HLA, DQ2, and DQ8. The environmental exposure is gluten. But why is it that 30% of the population carries HLA, DQ2, DQ8, but only 1% get celiac disease? So it's not the genes that cause the disease. The genes say you're vulnerable to the disease. You pull at a chain, it always breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end, your heart, your brain, your liver, your gut, wherever your weakest link is, 
That's what your genes determine. But you have to be pulling on the chain. So eating wheat pulls on the chain. That's the environmental trigger for those people. But it's not enough because everybody eats wheat and 30% of the population has the genes. So what else is there? There is a loss of integrity of the epithelial barrier of the gut. Slang term is intestinal permeability or leaky gut. There is activation of immune response trying to protect you. And there's the microbiome and the contribution of a dysbiotic microbiome that sets us up for an immune system trying to protect us from the environmental triggers. Do you think autoimmune disease can be reversed by addressing these five components? Oh, absolutely. We see it all the time. And I'm not sure I can use the word reversed, but certainly put into remission. We have seen many, many different autoimmune conditions where the antibodies that are causing the autoimmune condition come down to normal. The symptoms disappear. The tissue rebuilds and regenerates sometimes. Now, if you've got advanced rheumatoid arthritis and your joints are all deformed, my experience, you're not gonna change the deformation of the joints, but the inflammation dissipates, so the pain dissipates. Let's talk a little bit more about emotional wellness because we were speaking about this over breakfast where it's the one that people often avoid the most. They don't want to go there. It's very, very threatening. Why? Because those neural networks that were formed as a child and we survived as best we could in a threatening environment, whatever it was, whether it was uh, an abusive house uh, household, whether it was trauma, um, when you're a child, you you try to survive any way you can. And those neural networks that develop, when you're exposed to a similar type of stress as an adult, those are the neural networks that are activated. So those survival mechanisms come into play. Now you've got more tempering of your immediate response as an adult, but those are the neural networks. And instead of screaming as an adult, you may just get all keyed up and your heart rate kicks up and your breathing becomes shallow and fast. <laughs> all, it just depends on what your response mechanism is. But those neural networks were developed to save your life. They are part of what's called the sympathetic nervous system, a sympathetic response, the fight, flight, or fright. And until people deal with recognizing what those wiring patterns of the brain are that developed in childhood, I'll give you an example. You're an infant and you start screaming and crying. Your mother runs into the room to see what's wrong. There's nothing wrong. What does she do? She gives you the breast or she gives you a bottle or she gives you a cookie so that you stop crying and you feel better. Well, it may have been a bird that flew by the window and it just scared the heck out of you. But you begin associating fear with oral gratification. And so anytime anything fearful, anything that kind of catches you and makes you apprehensive comes up, there is a neural network that says oral gratification. And you eat something or you drink something. And for people who are trying really hard to lose weight and they're being careful, not eating excess calories and not eating junk food, they're having a hard time, there's a neural network set up that often has to be addressed. Yeah, it's just this lack of awareness that it comes down to, that people, they, they might not even be breathing properly and yeah. they don't even realize right. they're just not even getting oxygen into their body. It can be really crazy. Tell me a bit about what you found around infertility. And gluten. Oh my goodness, that's what got me into a lot of the, that's actually, that's what got me into this whole world. Uh, 1979, I was an intern. My wife and I could not get pregnant. I called the seven most famous holistic doctors I'd ever heard of. And their office managers were kind enough to let me speak with them. That's why in my office, my staff always had the dictate. Someone calls, a student calls, you or a doctor calls, make sure I get the message as soon as I can, you know, within the day, uh, so I can respond to them because um, seven most famous doctors helped me when we reached out to them. And I said, hi, I'm just an intern, uh, but I'm wondering, we can't get pregnant. What do you do? And they would say, well, do you know what a category one is? No, learn, okay. And I'd write down category one and they'd write down about folic acid and they'd, uh, all these things. I put a program together. We were pregnant in six weeks. My neighbors in married housing, we lived on campus at the time, they had gone through artificial insemination and nothing had worked. 
they asked if I'd work with them. And I said, well, you know, I don't really know that it's going to hurt you. Okay, sure, okay. They were pregnant in three months. So before I got out in practice, I was hot to trot to help every couple get pregnant that was having problems getting pregnant. I was treating people out of our dorm room before I was in the clinic because we were really happy to be pregnant and our friends would tell their sister in Wisconsin that um, this they young doctor, they just all of a sudden, and she would fly down from Wisconsin and come to my dorm room and I would work with them. And so we've helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, couples over the years get pregnant, whether it's recurrent miscarriages or infertility. And there's not much in medicine that's all or every, but this is an every. Clinically speaking, this was an every. Every couple that wanted to get pregnant, every couple were eating foods that were causing inflammation in their body and they didn't know it. They didn't know it. Take those foods out of the diet, that's the first step. And the most common was wheat. Take those foods out of the diet and all of a sudden the inflammation goes down and many of those people were pregnant uh, shortly thereafter, many of the couples. And we've all heard the story of a couple trying to get pregnant, they can't get pregnant, they can't get pregnant, they can't get pregnant. They go through artificial insemination, they do everything they can, it doesn't work. So finally they decide to adopt. And when they decide to adopt and they're in the adoption process, all of a sudden they get pregnant. So what does that tell you? Well, it was the emotional side of the pyramid that wasn't being addressed. Whatever that was, that had a major role to play for them. We do a lot of infertility stuff at Shift and the emotion's there. And if it doesn't start with emotion, it ends with emotion, it perpetuates it because every single cycle they go through this loss process and this grieving process. So it's massive. I've had a lot of conversations around wheat and gluten and grains and sugar in the last few weeks, but not too much about dairy. Tell me about dairy in the context of gut health, but also in total health. Oh, um, cow milk protein is meant for a cow. The protein molecule is eight times the size of human breast milk protein molecules. Goat milk is six times the size. Our bodies can't digest it completely. It'll break it down partially. It saves lives. There's no question it saves lives. But when you have an option for something else, you don't want to use the milk of other animals. If you have to use the milk of other animals, those that are more homogenous with human breast milk, meaning it's not as likely to trigger an immune response, are reindeer, donkey, and camel milk. Those three are much safer in terms of animal-based milk products. And uh, there's a camel milk farm in uh, the U.S. Uh, I met the owner of the ranch one day, and he said, hi, I run such and such camel farm. Really? Yeah. Camels. Man, those are ugly looking animals, right? <laughs> and he said, would you like to try our products? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. And they sent me some product and put it in the refrigerator. And I just couldn't get my head wrapped around a camel. I couldn't do it. Right? And so I saw him, oh, six months later. How is the camel milk? Oh, I'm sorry, man. I was traveling so much and it expired. Oh, we'll send you some more. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so I got some more and I, you know what? I'll try this. Okay. So I took a bowl of granola, which I don't eat very often, but gluten-free granola. And uh, so I poured the camel's milk. And I said, all right, let's give this a shot. And it's, whoa, this is good. It was really good. So now I, without hesitancy, I'm happy to recommend organic camel's milk uh, because it's less allergenic to humans. So when your children need a milk product, uh, now I have experience with it. Camel's milk is great. And some people have told me it makes great yogurt. So when you want to give your kids yogurt or if you like yogurt, you know, I had this little yogurt maker back in the 1970s. A little container had six glass jars that sat in it and you plug it in. It's a really low heat. And in two days, three days, you got yogurt, right? So, I mean, it's not hard to make. And so you can make it with uh, camel's milk, donkey milk, reindeer milk, depending on what, where you live and what your resources are. Cow's milk, however, the, in my book, you'll see the studies on casein, which is um, usually about somewhere between 4 to 6% of the protein in cow's milk. Casein is really hard to digest. That's why bodybuilders like to take casein uh, protein powders 
at night because they keep, uh, they're hard to digest. So all night long, you're getting a little more protein, little more protein, little more protein. Whereas they use whey protein before workouts because the whey protein is very easy to digest, right? But casein will cause B4, capital B, number four. And it's a term I came up with in, it's in my book, and I hope the whole world will start using it. B4 stands for a breach of the blood-brain barrier. You get a leaky brain when you take uh, casein. And just go to PubMed and type in casein and sudden infant death syndrome. And there are studies that theorize it's the breach of the blood-brain barrier from cow's milk that causes the inflammation that triggers SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Whoa. <laughs> that's, um, that's crazy. Yeah, and yeah. Now, listen, if there's nothing else in the world available, you feed your child cow's milk to survive. But you start dialing down what the options are. So you use the life jacket whenever you need it. But you look for options that are less allergenic, less likely to stimulate your immune system to try and protect you. Have you listened to season one of The Shift? If you're enjoying the expert series, you'll love season one, where we deep dive into the field of gut health with 25 of the world leaders in this area. Head back to your podcast app and find episode one. It's a great place to start. The Shift! Tell me about leaky brain. Uh, the technical term is a breach of the blood-brain barrier. And the components of the blood-brain barrier are the same and similar to all of the components of the intestinal barrier. You get a leaky gut, you get a leaky brain. When you get uh, one of the more common tests used today to identify a leaky gut, pathogenic intestinal permeability, is antibodies to the zonulin family of proteins and antibodies to actin and myosin. Well, the zonulin family of proteins and actin and myosin are components of the blood-brain barrier. So when you do a blood test and you're looking for antibodies to identify uh, pathogenic intestinal permeability, the antibodies are in your blood. You, you aren't checking the gut, you're checking the blood to see if the antibodies are there that cause the gut problem. Well, if they're in the blood, they go everywhere. They don't just go to the gut, they go everywhere in your body, which means they go to the brain. They go past the brain, they go past the kidneys. You get a leaky gut, you got a leaky bladder, you got a leaky kidney, you got a leaky brain. Just depending on your genetic vulnerability, where's it manifesting? So leaky brain, you know, <laughs> I love my wife. You know, uh, we were married two years ago and uh, for our honeymoon, we went to Costa Rica for six weeks, right? And uh, I can work anywhere as long as I have internet now. Uh, and so I read 93 research papers on the blood-brain barrier <laughs> on our honeymoon. 93. And my wife loved it because she had always had a goal to get really dark, really dark. So we had plenty of time. So, honey, just time yourself, strategize. So she sunbathed out by the pool. And I was in the shade there every day. Uh, uh, reading my research papers, looking up and seeing my beautiful wife in a bikini at the pool, this beautiful scenery. And I just looked up and I said, there is a God. Thank you so much. Right? <laughs> but as a result of reading the 93 research papers, a test came out six months later that looks at a breach of the blood-brain barrier. And it looks at 18 different markers of brain inflammation. It's called the brain zoomer. And there's never been a test like this before. 97 to 99% sensitivity, 98 to 100% specificity on identifying, do you have inflammation in your brain? And as I talk about it a lot in the book, in my book, which is called You Can Fix Your Brain, just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. So I talk about the, the uh, brain zoomer uh, uh, quite a bit in that book. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's called the neural zoomer, not brain zoomer, neural zoomer. And I talk about it quite a bit. You want to identify, do I have inflammation in my brain? Listen, here's the thing. Everybody knows someone that had a heart attack and survived, changed their diet, started exercising. Now they look better than they felt in years. They look better and they feel better than they've been in years. Most of us know someone diagnosed with cancer. They went through protocols. It's in remission. They're doing great. Nobody knows anyone 
diagnosed with a brain deterioration disease that's doing great. It terrifies us, and we don't know what to do about it. It's no different than any other symptom. You just have to go back upstream and figure out what's going on. So the neural zoomer tells you, you got inflammation in your brain right now, right now. It doesn't tell you why. It says, this is what's going on. Well, I feel fine. Really? Didn't you say you walk in the room and sometimes you forget why you walked in the room? Or where are my keys? Or yeah, I'm just not remembering names the way I used to? Yeah, 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 but I'm getting older. How old are you? I'm 42. No, that's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to be able to learn new languages in your 80s. You know, but your brain is going down and it scares the heck out of us because we don't know what to do. Read my friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's. Read how he runs the Buck Institute at UCLA, the Alzheimer's Research Center. Read how they've reversed Alzheimer's in hundreds of patients. And Dr. Bredesen now has trained physicians all over the world doing the Bredesen protocol. You can fix your brain. That's what my book is about. And so the first thing people have to realize, doctors need to realize, because we've never been told this before, is how common a breach of the blood-brain barrier is. And that's what the neural zoomer is for. So you can identify not only that you've got inflammation in the brain, but you've got a breach of the blood-brain barrier. And how many books do you have now? Two. So two books, um, traveling around the world, being the health advocate, doing amazing work. What's something that you're really passionate about right now? Everything I do. We just had a conference. I was the chairman of the conference in India. And we had, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, 700 people in attendance. They had hoped for 200, but we put together the dream team and 700 came. They were sitting in the aisles uh, and they had to get two other rooms and put um, large screen TVs in the rooms to, so that, you know, for the overflow. And we had over 4,000 on live stream uh, uh, for this event. And it's a game changer. It's all available to people online. And you go to the doctor.com, the dr.com forward slash ISWD 2019. And it's all there for you. Uh, Dr. Bland's interview, all of the presentations. And this is what I did in that. And I'm hoping it sets the stage for everybody. I asked all of the, the presenters from all over the world, I said, send me the articles that you're referencing in your slides. So all of the articles are there for every attendee and everyone that watches this. You can get all of the research articles. And if the articles were free, you've got the whole article. If they're not free, we can't give you the article, but we give you the link to the abstract for every single article. Because what's the point of attending a weekend conference with tremendous information and you get so overwhelmed you don't know what to do on Monday morning? What's the point if you can't research some of this afterwards and follow up? And doctors don't have the time to go look for research articles. They're not gonna do it. So we give you the articles, they're all there. And so we set all that up. And then I came here to Australia to do our full day certified gluten practitioner program. And it turned out to be a small audience, you know, and, which is great because they all got personal attention. Uh, and we wa uh, they walked out at the end of the day after a long day with me, their brains were uh, uh, completely saturated, empowered, uh, enthusiastic. Remember the God within? enthusiastic that this is now a part of what they're going to include in all of their protocols. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity. You know, uh, I know that I'm watched over. I know that my angels are watching me and protecting me. And as long as I'm on the planet, this is not a job. This is my passion. This is my joy of life. It's so clear to see that in everything you do as well. Like you've just, we're even saying that there's this little twinkle in your eye, you know, that I love it. So this program's called The Shift and it's about how people make shifts from where they don't want to be to where they want to be in their health, in their life, um, in their situation and by making that shift transforming yeah, into the next version of themselves. Can you think of a time in your life where you made a really significant shift? When I married my wife. My wife's younger and she wants kids, and I said, sure, okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. So we're starting a family. And, uh, but what it meant to have the perfect partner was I, had, I have to let go of who I've been. 
I have to let go of the way that I th- respond, the way that I think about life to be open to new adventures. You know, um, I guess an example of that would be, I had the opportunity to come to India in 2006. And uh, we were the guests of the Dalai Lama. And so we went to Dharamsala, the the um, headquarters for the Tibetan government in, in exile. And it was a powerful experience for me. And I've not been back. And now I just came from India. My wife and I spent three weeks after the conference traveling all around into Varanasi and to a number of the holy places. We we're on the River Ganges and, uh, in a canoe before sunrise and the sun pops up over the river and people are chanting on shore and you know the whole spiritual experience. It was really quite fabulous. But that three-week trip, my friend from the, who I met on my first trip to India owns a travel agency in Delhi. And I said, Naveen, we're going to be coming to India. And my new wife and I, we'd like to spend three weeks go, traveling around India. Oh, Dr. Thompson. Oh, Dr. Thompson. Oh, sir. Yo, oh, very good, very good. I'm happy to coordinate for you. But you must promise me to leave your mind behind because he knows me, right? <laughs> and leave your mind behind and be open to the experiences that come. And so I did, and it was just a transformative experience to go to all these places. We went to this one place, and I don't remember the name of it. There were 10 million pilgrims there. It happens every, uh, I think it's every 16 years, uh, there's 20 million, and at the halfway point, every eight years, there's 10 million people. And this was the second day, and they were there. So it was a three-hour drive from Varanasi, and we went to this place, and there are gurus everywhere, holy men all painted up, and, you know, uh, and uh, there were naked gurus walking around and people chanting and singing, and the air was just full of incense and chanting, and it's a whole other world. You know, it's like it transforms you. So I had to leave my mind behind. And... um, my willingness to do that, my willingness to do that in my relationship now. um, And I I truly believe it's the secret to success in relationship. The secret is for the guy, and I'm a little chauvinistic, I guess, but for the guy, I will do everything I can to take care of you. I will supply every need you have. Uh, I'll protect you. Uh, You got me 100%. And for, and that's my giving to her, but then my response to her is I do whatever she says, whatever it is. The secret to success is yes, dear. Happy wife, happy life. Right, happy wife, happy life. And because I have to trust, I picked the partner that has my well being in mind, not hers. And she does. She has my well-being in mind. She's protecting me, not what's best for her. And she gets pure joy out of making sure I have everything I need that I'm taken care of so I can go out in the world and do my work. She gets pure joy in that. And so for me, that's a win-win relationship, right? And so in healthcare for our docs, paradigm shift is required. It's a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts don't occur in stages. It's like do or die. You change the way that you think. And here's the example, and it's one of yours. Barry Marshall, the microbiologist, 1984. He says, you know, I think that sometimes ulcers are caused by a bacterial infection. Everybody thought this guy was a nutcase. Everybody knows that ulcers are caused by too much acid and you have to take antacids to stop the production of hydrochloric acid because it's the acid that's eating up the stomach. Everybody knows that. And he was ostracized. So what'd the guy do? He does an endoscopy, takes a picture of the healthy pink tissue of his stomach. He drinks a beaker of Heliobacter pylori, the bacteria. He drinks a beaker of it waits a few weeks until he's sick as a dog, does another endoscopy, takes a picture of his ulcerated stomach. 
Then he takes the antibiotics to kill the bacteria, waits another few weeks, does another endoscopy, take a picture of his healthy pink tissue in his stomach, and then he publishes it, and then everybody knows he's a nutcase. But he proved it to where we all now know ulcers, you check for heliobacter. 21 years later, the guy wins the Nobel Prize in medicine. And the Nobel Committee said, and this is the exact quote, who with tenacity and a prepared mind challenged prevailing dogma. You have to prepare your mind in order to make a paradigm shift. How do you do that? You have to have the tenacity. One hour a week, you walk up and down the aisles of the periodicals. You look to see what grabs you and you just do the deep dive one hour a week. You study functional medicine one hour a week. You study food sensitivities one hour a week. You study about holistic approach to thyroid. It doesn't matter what you study, but it's the tenacity, the consistency that creates the environment for the paradigm shift. And for every one of our patients, you wanna be healthy? You need to take ownership for yourself. But it's overwhelming. You're not trained in that. You don't know the language. You don't know what all this stuff means. So one hour a week, you learn this. And in six months, you've got this down. And you and your family have vibrant health. I love that. It's fantastic. I've got one last question for you. If you could give just one piece of advice to someone that wanted to make a shift in their health, what would it be? Learn how to create a balanced microbiome. Perfect. Succinct. Thank you so much. There was so much amazing information in this episode, so let's make sure that we've gotten the key points and the actions that you can take as a result of this. Number one, when we're swimming in the pond of disease, it's okay to use a life jacket, but we need to go upstream to see what pushed us down there in the first place. In other words, it's okay to take drugs or use a symptomatic solution as a short-term fix, but you still need to head upstream and find the underlying cause or you won't be able to get out of the pond. Number two, most autoimmune diseases have five components that can lead to their development. Genetic vulnerability, an environmental trigger, intestinal permeability, oral triggers that usually come from food, and the health and diversity of the microbiome. Number three, gluten is an immunoreactive protein and is associated with many autoimmune diseases and conditions. If you've listened to season one of The Shift, you probably already get this. And if you haven't, I'd recommend tuning in. Number four, cow's milk is meant for cows. So it makes sense that it can cause some reactivity and issues in humans. There are many studies that show that the components of dairy, such as casein and lactose, are harmful for our health. So it's definitely something we need to look out for. Number five. A breach of the blood-brain barrier, or leaky brain, leads to neuroinflammation. This is important to avoid because neuroinflammation affects our brain health and function and is also a risk factor for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as memory loss. As Dr. Tom said, we should be able to learn new languages in our 80s, but we've accepted that a damaged brain as we age is normal. Cognitive decline is an early sign of a damaged brain, and it's something that you should sit up and pay attention to. Okay, so learning is great, but action is better. Here are a few things that you could do as a result of this conversation in order to help you shift your health and your life. Number one. Go gluten-free. Okay, I know we've talked about this a lot, but here is what I think. Gluten is not great for any human to have on a daily basis. When I'm consulting with my patients, I recommend that all of them take gluten out of the everyday diet. But there are a subset of patients where I really believe they need to avoid gluten altogether. These are patients with autoimmune diseases, things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, asthmatics, people with allergies or any immune issues, people who get recurrent sinusitis or hay fever, if you have PCOS, endometriosis or infertility, and lastly, anyone who has digestive problems is really better off on a gluten-free diet. Personally, I avoid gluten in my everyday diet. 
However, from time to time, I will eat it if I'm out without any problems. What I say to you is that it is the ongoing and persistent exposure to gluten and the type and the amount that we're having that is the problem. So having it once a month is probably not gonna cause you significant harm. Now, if you have celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, however, even small exposures may be harmful. See a naturopath or functional medical doctor if you're unsure and listen to episode nine of this podcast for more information. Number two, consider your emotional responses and how that plays into your health picture. Emotional wellness is so often overlooked, yet it can be the key to your recovery. The first step is observation. Be present and observe your emotions and see how you react to things day to day. Number three, Think about cutting dairy out of your daily diet. And if you are eating it, have it in an organic and fermented form, such as yogurt or cheese. Again, if you need help with this, join our group at theshiftclinic.com forward slash group. Number four, review your brain health. Your memory and recall is one of the best indicators of brain health. So if you're becoming more forgetful, feel foggy headed or are suffering from emotional issues, it's worth seeing a naturopath or functional medical doctor to assess where you're at and recommend a course of treatment. Listen to episode six of The Shift for more on brain health. There is certainly a lot of change that needs to happen to improve our collective health. And I'm very grateful that we have passionate advocates such as Dr. Tom O'Brien leading the way in this area. If you loved this episode, please let us know by leaving us a review or sharing on social media. Please tag myself, Catherine Maslin, or The Shift Clinic so that we can hear what you have to say. If you'd love to find out more about Dr. Tom, you can visit his website, thedoctor.com. That's T-H-E-D-R dot com, where you'll find a heap of useful information as well as links to purchase his wonderful books. Dr. Tom has also recently released a docu-series on autoimmunity called Betrayal. This docu-series is for people who are dealing with any one of the hundreds of autoimmune conditions, including Hashimoto's, ulcerative colitis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and many more. As always, you'll find a link in the show notes to check it out. In the next episode of The Shift, you'll hear from integrative rheumatologist and environmental health expert, Dr. Ailey Cohen. What we discuss around environmental toxicity is something you really don't want to miss. So make sure you tune in. Coming up on The Shift. So what did you discover once you started studying that side of medicine? How deficient we are in our medical training. I think that was the most shocking. Do you think there's a social responsibility for these companies to actually make a change at that level? I absolutely do. I think that playing off of the ignorance of the public is really something that's, you know, saddens me and also confuses me. How long do you think it'll take for things to change? I think it's going to take a little time, but it's building. And I think it's building also because we have a lot to be concerned about. By now, you might be beginning to wonder what the health of your gut is like. To find out more, take our free online assessment at theshiftclinic.com forward slash quiz. It only takes five minutes and you'll get a great report with some suggestions to get you started.